Hello. My talk is about uh, the nature of professional assessment, and I'm attempting to do two things. First of all, to see whether or not uh, there are insights from discussions in epistemology which will bear on the question of professional and vocational assessments. And also, and secondarily, I'm interested in the issue of whether or not um, the philosophical theses can actually be sustained against detailed examples from professional and vocational education. Uh, one of the reasons I'm interested in that is that a lot of the discussion within the mainstream epistemology tradition has tended to use perhaps rather trivial examples. And uh, I'd like to expand the range of consideration to more complex and difficult issues. But my main focus, as I say, is on the nature of how we assess professional knowledge and professional action. And I, I mean by that quite broadly, both what we term the professions like medicine and teaching, and also what are, also what are known as occupations, vocational occupations such as bricklaying. So I'm, I'm covering the whole field, really. I, I would like you to bear that in mind. And I also think that what I'm talking about does have some bearing on the assessments of teachers as well. So I want to examine rather briefly this epistemological debate about know-how. It's usually framed, perhaps unhelpfully, in terms of intellectualism, which very crudely and slightly inaccurately is the view that uh, human know-how can best be explained in terms of uh, mental rather than action terms. So, for example, know-how is knowing that a certain proposition is the case or being acquainted with a way of doing something. Rileyanism, a term I use uh, to indicate the tradition arising from the work of Gilbert Ryle, emphasizes the role of action in attributing know-how to individuals. Uh, perhaps underplays, possibly, the role that propositional or systematic knowledge has in people's know-how. So it's not necessarily the best way of looking at these questions, thinking of it in terms of a, a kind of ding-dong battle between these two positions. I'm going to argue that neither Rileyanism, at least conceived in a simplistic way, nor intellectualism are adequate for giving an account of how professional practice can be assessed. So we need to be clearer about the relationship between different kinds of knowledge. And by that, I don't mean we need to have a theory, a kind of unifying theory, a reduction of one to the other, for example, but rather we need to get a perspicuous overview of the relationships between propositional knowledge, practical knowledge, and maybe acquaintance knowledge as well. There's quite a lot at stake here. Without a clear view of professional know-how and expertise, we will be unable to explore the strengths and weaknesses of various ways of assessing it. And such inability may lead to costly mistakes in terms of the construction of inadequate and even harmful qualifications. Another point I'd like to make is that in awarding a professional qualification, we very often offer a guarantee, not just that the candidate has certain skills, but rather that they know how to practice an occupation. And that's a far more demanding condition. And this implies, at the very least, that the individual concerned is able to practice the occupation. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that a, a lot of the talk about uh, assessment of professional knowledge is couched in a rather reductive terminology about skills and competences, and I think uh, this is quite seriously limiting. And I, I'd like to shift the focus of the discussion away from those elements of know-how, important though they undoubtedly are. So these requirements imply that candidates for qualifications, for professional qualifications, are actually able to perform actions and make judgments implied by being a member of the occupation. They're able to act as a member of the occupation. That is to say that they have a know-how that encompasses the range of activities in the occupation. They are able to follow and ad adapt to evolutions within the occupation. They can interact with 
with members of adjacent occupations, and they have a civic role as well, understanding the role of the occupation in the broader society. In practice, in day-to-day -day work, this often implies working in variable, complex, and unpredictable circumstances. It goes without saying, we usually expect a very high standard of performance from a professional. The problem for assessors is that we may also have a limited range of data on which to base our judgments, and that's a significant challenge. A brief digression here. Um, the English language is, perhaps doesn't make distinctions, important distinctions, as readily as some other languages, like uh, the ones that I'm familiar with, French and German. So someone, someone knows how to do something can mean either that that person is able to do that thing, where that, that action is goal-directed, normatively constrained and evaluable, or it can mean that person can give an account of how it is that one does something. And I would maintain that these are distinct, though related, capacities. What exactly is the relationship between the two? Um, I'd like to argue it's something like this. If someone knows how to do something in the sense that they can give an account of how to do it, then they are able to give an account of how to do it. Therefore, knowing how in the account sense is itself an ability to do something. Not the same thing as what you give the account of, admittedly, but it, is, it does involve an ability. So both kinds of know-how involve the exercise of ability, albeit uh, somewhat different, although related, abilities. So what do the intellectualist claims amount to? There are two ways in which the account is developed. The first, due to Stanley and Williamson, goes something like this. To say that someone knows how to do something is to say that they know that there is a way of doing that thing. The alternative account due to Bankston and Moffat is to say that to know, for someone to know how to do something is for them to be acquainted with a way of doing that thing. And you will notice that in both these cases, the notion of a way of performing the action a way of doing the thing is quite crucial to the account. In fact, it's almost taken for granted that to know how to do something is to involve a way of doing that thing. Now, the non-intellectualist claim roughly boils down to this, that to say that someone knows how to do something means that A is able to do that thing, to perform the relevant action under certain conditions. It doesn't necessarily imply that A knows a way of doing that thing. A point that I'll return to later. So a variant of the intellectualist claim, uh, this is owed to David Brown here, is that someone knows how to do something means something like the person knows the answer to the question how does one do that thing? But then we can, are entitled to ask the question, how do we know that someone knows the answer to the question? And one presumes that we know that by them being able to offer the correct answer. So it, even in this case, where know-how is a case of providing the correct answer to a question, it's hard to see how this form of know-how um, can't be conceived of as an ability. But, and I do want to emphasize this, it may well be a very important ability in assessing occupational know-how. So, to flesh all this out uh, in a little bit more detail, um, I'm going to try and describe some characteristics of know-how that we need to take account of in constructing any form of assessment. And these three features that I have here, repeatability, stability and variability are also held in common with other human powers which are not necessarily forms of know-how. Like, for example, the ability to breathe is clearly a human power, but we would hesitate to call it a form of know-how. 
So, first of all, repeatability is that the ability to be called such must be capable of repeated manifestation in appropriate circumstances. Stability refers to the fact that the, although the performance may vary according to circumstances, it will only do so within a certain range which our grasp of the concept of the ability in question will normally recognize. And finally, and this attribute here is, as you can see, intention is in tension with stability, the idea of variability. The idea is that performance, exercise of the power, will vary as appropriate within the range which is understood to be the mark of the concept. And I will exemplify all these with an example in a minute. When we move to know-how as such, as, as a specific feature of human abilities, um, there are three elements which I think are worth drawing your attention to. First of all, intentionality. The ability is exercised for a purpose. Secondly, e explicability. There will be a possible explanation of why the action embodying the ability is or should be performed. Such an explanation will at least be capable of including the technique, if any, that's employed, the purpose for which the action was carried out, and any ele elements of variability which uh, the situation might require for successful performance. And finally, and this is a very important one, I think, is that know-how has got the attribute of evaluability. It is actions embodying know-how are almost always appraisable according to norms relating to the quality of the performance. And these may draw on vocabulary from a technical dimension, an aesthetic dimension, or a moral dimension. So what does all that rather abstract set of criteria mean in practice? Let's take an example of a bricklayer. If he knows how to practice his occupation, his work is repeatable. He can repeat it uh, in appropriate circumstances. His performance is consistent. He reaches a standard of performance. But the performance varies according to circumstances. There is an element of variability, both in terms of the contract he's working to, uh, in terms of the conditions under which he is working, and various other possibly local conditions. It is clearly done for a purpose. We do expect that the bricklayer should be able to, if called upon, explain within limits why he has done what he's done. And finally, his work is evaluable. We may assess it according to standards of excellence, technical, aesthetic, and moral that apply to the occupation. And I'm going to argue that the intellectualist approach has a particular problem with this final criterion of evaluability. Knowing a way to do something may be ne neither necessary or sufficient for knowing how to do things. Some things, at any rate. There are some things that I may know how to do without actually knowing a way of, of doing them. I may, for example, know how to solve a problem without knowing a way to solve the problem. The task is precisely to find a way of solving the problem. And there are also cases um, where somebody knows a way to do something, and I don't just mean in the account sense, they can provide a count of how to do it, they may even possess the technique for doing it, but they are unable to actually exercise that technique, as it were, transmuted into a skill because they are unable to exercise it in the circumstances that actually obtain. Just to pursue some of the difficulties with the intellectualist approach, uh, look at Bengtsson and Moffat. They argue that to know how to do something may be embarked on a vicious regress. Um, I don't think we are, actually, but I do think that intellectualists do find themselves saddled with a slightly uncomfortable consequence that in order to arrest this regress at a certain point, the intellectualist does seem to be committed to there being a form of 
basic non-evaluable know-how which underlies the evaluable know-how. And it, it leaves you with a, with a rather clumsy account, I would say, of this important characteristic of know-how. Um, just go more quickly through this. Uh, in order to assess whether someone knows how to do something, I would maintain that we need a demonstration that they can do what they're supposed to know how to do. But the necessary variability in circumstances means that performance will vary according to circumstances. We, we should expect to see different performances on different occasions according to different circumstances. The evaluability criterion suggests that there's going to be variable acro variability across individuals as well as occasions, and we will see performances of different quality and different nuance according to different people who are carrying out the actions as well. And that seems to lead to the consequence that assessing someone's abilities in an occupation based on single in situ performances may not be adequate to form a good idea of someone's know-how, which leaves us with a problem. Right. Um, Intentionality is also important. We need to know very often from people in professional situations, why did you do F rather than G in the way that you did it on that occasion? So why did you choose one course of action rather than another? And there's also the criterion of explicability. Why did you do what you did in the way that you did it on that particular occasion. And we may find this to be of particular importance since we cannot, before awarding a, a professional qualification, um, assess all the hypothetical situations or even more than a small range of actual situations where we can assess whether or not the candidate is capable of choosing one course of action rather than another or uh, of doing things in a certain way rather than another. And we need to eliminate um, two possibilities in particular, and I owe those terms to uh, Jonathan Bennett from a slightly different context. First of all, there's fake know-how. A might be able to do something on a particular occasion without actually knowing how to do it. We've all heard of beginner's luck and flukes and similar phenomena. These are examples of fake know-how. Frozen know-how, on the other hand, is where somebody does know how to do something on, a, on occasion and may even be able to repeat their performance on very similar occasions, but cannot cope with variation where the circumstances change considerably, where, for example, the bricklayer is quite happy laying bricks at ground level in calm weather but is incapable of adapt adapting to circumstances such as height and wind. So we need to eliminate fake and frozen know-how. I'm now going to move on um, to a slightly different question. Um, I, English, again, doesn't have a really good term for what I want to talk about here. Um, Gilbert Ryle, in a later work of his uh, on thinking, uh, placed a particular emphasis on it. He used the term adverbial verbs to uh, describe a rather large class of, of actions uh, that people might perform. I'm going to focus on a, quite a narrow range here, uh, and I've just enumerated them there. Activities such as being able to plan, to coordinate, and to evaluate. How and why these are done vary, varies greatly with circumstances, and planning, for example, may employ different skills in different circumstances. Uh, what I want to say here is that we shouldn't identify, for example, planning with possessing planning skills. I may possess a planning skill such as being able to draw a diagram or a flow chart without actually being able to plan satisfactorily. Drawing a diagram is not the same as planning. So, with these more uh, complex forms of know-how, we will wish to combine 
practical assessment, responses to hypothetical situations, and post hoc explanations from the candidates. In such situations, to know how to to know how to explain or justify what has been done or what ought to be done is vital, as well as the demonstrable ability to act in a, an appropriate way for one task or project. And here, the, the notion of being able to give an account of what you're doing or what you would do in certain circumstances is important for our ability to assess occupational capacity. These sorts of cases uh, are particularly important where the occupation concerned requires a degree of independent agency. Not just the bricklayer who is able to lay a line of bricks or build an arch, but one who is expected to plan and evaluate his work. For example, and the point applies a fortiori for comp complex traditional professional occupations where you are expected to work in complex and unpredictable situations, draw on theoretical knowledge informing judgments about what to do, and also to see through long and complex projects. And I would like to say that it's not just the traditional professional, the doctor or the lawyer or the priest, who may be expected to engage in these longer drawn out forms of activity, what I've called project management, perhaps not the most happy term, but I couldn't think of a better one. Um, there's another difficult issue uh, in connection with professional knowledge and its assessment, and it's to do with what's sometimes called tacit knowledge. And what I'm going to mean by tacit knowledge is simply this, that our ability to, to do something very often outruns our ability to explain how why or how we do that thing in the way that we do. And we call the gap between our ability to do it and our explanation of how to do it the tacit knowledge component of our know-how. So the question arises, and, and this has been argued in a very able way in a recent book by Neil Gascoigne and Tim Thornton, that it is possible to provide context-dependent accounts of how we fill this gap. They admit that you can't give full explanations of the, the gap, almost by definition you can't, but they do say that de demonstration and ostension, this is how I do it, can actually fill the gap. So there is a sense in which, they argue, there is a propositional aspect even to tacit knowledge because you can use context-dependent propositions to fill that gap. And I think myself that there are <coughs> excuse me problems with this. First of all, there is the issue of variability. Because of different occasions and different slightly different performances being required on those different occasions, the gap is actually a different one according to different circumstances. And the second problem with this view of tacit knowledge is to do with what I call evaluability. How well something is done depends not only on the occasions on which it's done, but on who is doing it and how they're doing it. So what I'm saying, I think, is that the, the know-how involved is the property of an individual and varies across individuals as well as across circumstances. Um, it cannot always be transmitted by demonstration or explanation but requires imitation and practice. So I'm not saying that Thornton and Gascoigne are wrong to say that there is something uh, not completely ineffable about tacit knowledge, but sometimes the gap cannot be filled by context-dependent explanations. And that poses a problem for assessment, um, which maybe will come, at, come up in discussion. So I'm now going to spend a little bit of time. How long do we have, by the way? Ten minutes. OK. Um, here's an example of a, an intellectualist account but from Bengtsson and Moffat of um, know-how as giving an account. And I'll just briefly try and show why I think this is inadequate. Here we have this individual, Pat, who's a ski instructor. She can successfully 
instructs skiers to do certain stunts, but can't do them herself. According to Benson and Moffat, she, can, she does know how to do the stunts because she can successfully provide an account of how to do them. So if Pat can provide an account of how to do a stunt, which guides someone successfully to actually do that stunt, then according to them, she knows how to do the stunt. But for Pat to do this, of course, she must be successfully able to provide an account of how to do the stunt, which is itself an ability. But that's not the real problem here. Um, and I can't do better, really, than quote from Alvar Noe commenting on this example. And he observes, uh, nothing about the way the case is described entails that the ski instructor knows how to perform the stunt. What she knows is how the stunt is done. But to know how the stunt is done is not necessarily to know how to do it. So I think that's absolutely right. It seems to me that Bengtsson and Moffat's definition could mean that one individual could know how to carry out the stunts on Pat's instructions, but meanwhile, most of her group would fail. And that seems to me to suggest that Pat does not even successfully know how to give instructions on how to do the stunts. So I think there are very serious problems in trying to give an account of know-how in terms of uh, accounts of how to do things. Which is not to say, and I do want to emphasize this, that giving an account may not form an important component of our assessment. I next want to consider Gettier cases, cases where the definition, the classical definition of knowledge as justified true belief breaks down. And some people, opponents of intellectualism, like Yuri Kath, have argued that um, if you can't construct these Gettier cases for know-how, then know-how isn't the same as know that. So here is an example provided by Yuri Kath. Um, this individual has learned to fly a plane according to a fake computer program. Some malevolent demon designed a fake computer program for flying aeroplanes. However, another malevolent demon in the meantime intervened and corrected this computer program. Or rather, um, the malevolent demon made a mistake or a fluke intervened and the program actually, not intentionally, provides correct instructions. So, Yuri Kath claims that A does know how to fly the plane, even though his justification for how he does this does not hold. Therefore, um, the Gettier parallel doesn't hold, and therefore, know-how is not the same as know that. Now, there is something right about that argument. There is also something quite disturbing about it. And um, the disturbance arises particularly, I think, once you move away from simple cases of performing a skill to more complex forms of professional activity. So we can admit that the individual concerned can provide an adequate justification for why he flies the plane as he does. And to this extent, the justification supports his know-how claim. But since the justification is of dubious provenance, it renders the justification subject to doubt, including any future justification from this source. Because theoretical justification is needed for some actions within the scope of the pilot's know-how, his claim to know-how is undermined because the underlying justification is undermined through its dubious provenance. And what I'm saying here, I think, is the, the assessment of professional know-how should be concerned with the provenance of theoretical justification, it should arise from a an established, reliable body of knowledge. Otherwise, our ability to successfully judge the quality of a candidate's know-how over a range of circumstances is undermined. If you like, the explicability criterion of know-how is jeopardized. Um, I'm going to bring this now to a conclusion. Um, so here's some general principles that arise tentatively about, out of what I've been saying. Qualifications are intended to provide a guarantee that the candidate can practice. Guarantees do not provide certainty. We should not be looking for certainty. 
but for a degree of confidence appropriate to the activity in question. It is important to assess performance. Judging an individual performance is a necessary but not sufficient condition for assessing professional know-how. It doesn't even provide a guarantee of repeatability or stability. You might need multiple observations for that. Individual performances will give a good basis for evaluating the quality of that individual's know-how, as in some circumstances will some, some kind of account of how they would do what they would do. As, as for the question of giving an account, so important in the Pat the Skier case, um, we must admit it can never be sufficient to establish professional know-how. However, accounts of how you would or how you do certain things are needed alongside performance to establish, for example, variability, how the candidate would vary performance according to circumstance, why the candidate would act in certain ways in different circumstances, and establishing whether the candidate understands why they're taking one course of action rather than another, or even not doing anything at all if you like, masterly in activity. Third point, assessing people's skills is important, but we also need to be able to assess these transversal abilities such as planning, evaluating, etc. And because they are very often connected and complementary, they are best assessed as part of the ability to carry out a project rather than just to execute certain discrete tasks. So, for example, we may ask the bricklayer, as a French maçon would be expected to do, to erect a two-story building. And to do that, you will need to draw on abilities to plan, to control, to communicate, to coordinate, and to evaluate in order to do that. So the assessment process would have to include uh, a full assessment of their ability to carry through that project. A fourth point, and I think I will stop at this point, um, is that we may also wish to assess individual characteristics or virtues. This isn't something that I've managed to get into what's necessarily a brief discussion, but it is certainly arguable that in order to carry out professional activities, you don't just need skills, as I've already said. You don't even just need what I've called transversal abilities, but you need to show to demonstrate certain aspects of character, uh, persistence, attention to detail, consideration for fellow workers, and so on. So these may be features which you want to look at as part of your assessment. And of course, that complicates the picture again. And finally, we may wish to assess occupational capacity, the ability to practice an occupation in its totality, including its history and trajectory, its interfaces with other occupations, and its wider civic impact on the society. And I'll finish at that point. Thank you. Questions one at a time. That's how Professor Vinci would like. So please keep the question short so that we can have more questions. Questions one is I was thinking that your account is very much dependent on the recognition of knowledge or expertise by a third person, other than the bearer of that knowledge. Would you allow that the self-knowledge may be a component of um, recognition of possession of this knowledge, or would this essentially have to be something which is judged externally? Right. That was one. The second is I was also thinking that your account is very much the individual as the bearer of the capability. Yes. Would there be justification in thinking of groups or contexts which are embedded with the capability and not necessarily individuals as bearers? Yes, I think those are both good points and I think the answer to them both is yes. Uh, Self-knowledge is very important, I think. Uh, knowing the range of your capacities, um, your own powers of endurance, uh, these are all features of knowledge of yourself, which are extremely important in, if you like, regulating your own performance, not being too ambitious, 
not being too unambitious. Uh, Self-knowledge is perhaps difficult to assess, but I think if we go back to the issue of giving an account, why did you do it that way rather than that way? Why did you stop there? Uh, these are questions the assessor can legitimately ask, and in doing so, can explore um, these aspects of self-knowledge. Now, on, on the second question, I think this is perfectly true. There, there's a, a range of occupations uh, which cannot be conducted successfully if you do not take account of the know-how and abilities and knowledge of colleagues who are working on the project. Um, a very good example of this, which is um, now coming to the fore in the northern European countries where heat loss from houses is an important issue, is this, that you can have a perfectly designed um, passive house, as it's called, where heat doesn't escape. But if the people building that house do not understand what each other are doing, the, the plasterer does not understand the work of the electrician, who doesn't understand the work of the plumber and so on, then they will fail. There will be heat loss in that house because they cannot jointly execute the enterprise together. So that's a major issue in the construction industry. How do you uh, construct qualifications which, which allow people to take account of the collective knowledge that's needed in those circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one would be like uh, you, uh, you talk about certain kinds of virtues of, of the person who is actually doing the action but not of the virtues of the one who is assessing the action. What kind of virtues should one ac exercise and what is, uh, you suggest like what should one look for while one is assessing but there should be an account of virtues as well of uh, how do we approach uh, the assessment process itself? The second question is uh, is is more about like you know the, the uh, what do we say is is the definition of the work that we are talking about? Say in the brick layer, brick laying example that you give, should uh, should we judge a brick layer by saying that you know there are advancements of technology and a person is supposed to say do certain kind of computational programmings? So to understand like how to lay a brick for example, but there yeah. is a person who has not learned that skill. Would you actually say that the, in assessing, would you say that it's, it's a complete task or is it not really uh, like complete? Because in your account it seems that one has to keep uh, updating oneself all the time. Like you know it's yes. because variability is such a, uh, uh, is, is a requirement there. But yeah. But how would this fit? Because it seems sometimes uh, it, we could still call that person as a bricklayer, right? And That's absolutely still, right, yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you for you. those questions. Um, to go to the first one about the, the virtues of the assessor, uh, obviously the ability to pay close attention, to be fair, to be very knowledgeable, and pre be prepared to be up to date with one's knowledge of the occupation. But there's a, uh, there is another one, which is quite important, I think, uh, quite a subtle one, uh, which is open-mindedness of a certain kind. Um, I, as the assessor, may not have done that task that way as the candidate is doing it. Um, I am different. It goes back to the point that Padma was making about self-knowledge. But I must be open-minded enough to acknowledge that that, too, may be a perfectly valid way of carrying out the project or task. Um, and I think that this, this sort of thing arises particularly with, with teaching. You know, I go in and I observe someone teaching. They have their own personality, their own way of approaching the task of teaching. It may not be the way in which I did it or I would do it, but I've got to be open-minded enough to understand that there are different ways of doing this. I think that that is really important for these more complex professional tasks. Now, on the second issue, um, I deliberately based my presentation on the idea of practicing an occupation um, rather than practicing a particular skill or even practicing a certain kind of craft, say a traditional craft, where very little changes over very long periods. The kinds of occupations that I had particularly in mind are, if you like, technical occupations which are to some extent based on scientific research or systematic bodies of knowledge. And what I was claiming was that in these areas where there is rapid change, both in economic, social, and technical circumstances, um, the bricklayer or whoever it might be 
needs the wherewithal to keep abreast of and adapt to those circumstances. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be acquainted with every last detail of the change. They may well need some further training, but they need enough, at least, if you like, basic intellectual equipment to be able to cope with change. But um, it, it seems to me that uh, your statement that, that giving an account of knowledge how is never sufficient is a bit too strong. It seems in some occupations, such as, I don't know, being a medical researcher writing the history of 18th century Italy, that being able to give an account of what, you're, of what one would do in that area would be sufficient to uh, uh, assess that person as knowing how to do so. Because without actually doing F, the person wouldn't be able to give an account of doing F in, in, in certain areas. Yeah. But I also think it's also uh, not necessary uh, so, so it does seem to me in some cases to be sufficient, that is, to be able to give an account. But in some cases, I think there re really is the gap uh, that it's uh, not necessary to uh, judge that someone knows how to F if he or she is not able to, to give an account mm -hmm. of how to do F, as in the bricklayer case where just time and again the particular bricklayer without being able to say one word about why he or she is able to do what he or she does, just does, does exactly what you ask and does it in, in, in just a perfect fashion. So it does seem as though, um, I, I don't know, in the effort to give a, a general um, view of this area, uh, you maybe need some uh, slight uh, qualifications to be not quite so sweeping. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to concede that. And I'll just go back to the, the point that I was making earlier on, that I, I was con essentially concerned with, with the know-how for professional abilities for which we are prepared to offer qualifications which act as, a, if you like, a social guarantee that the person can do that kind of thing. Now, in the case of your researcher, I would assume that in most cases, if, you're, if you can seeing this as a professional career with a qualification, you get something like a, a PhD, which demonstrates, among other things, that you have the ability to carry out research in a, in a certain area. And you are at least partly assessed in terms of uh, your ability to carry out relevant kinds of research. Now, the second example seems absolutely fine. We all know that there are people who can lay bricks without being able to explain it, or even people who can do it without qualification. That's absolutely fine. But my point was that in terms of providing the social guarantee that they know how to do what they claim to know how to do, we need to be a little bit more demanding in our expectations. The examples of occupations that have been taken up are that of a bricklayer and a ski instructor. Would our conclusions change if we take examples, say, of a poet, musician, or a painter? I think the answer is they probably would, particularly if we conceive of these occupations uh, as those which don't fall within the sphere of professional qualification. I, I don't know of any professional qualifications to become a poet. I, I don't even know what they would look like. Um, and certainly, uh, the case of a painter, for example, uh, although a certain amount of professionalization has taken place, I mean, to, to go to the, back to the points made by Stephen Phillips, um, it, it's clear that a lot of people very successfully practice such occupations uh, without the need for assessment. And, and very often, it's, it's again, to go back to the point about self-knowledge, it's a journey of self-discovery as much as anything else such as you find in a uh, German Bildungsroman like uh, Green Henry, where the hero sets out to become a painter, sets himself a series of tests to see whether he me measures up 
to what he takes to be the demands of the occupation and finds to his dismay that he doesn't actually measure up to them. So yes, I, I, I completely concede that there are a range of occupations which do not fall within the ambit of professional qualification and probably shouldn't do so either. Okay. Um, my question is about what you mean by account, giving an account, because it seems to me that in a way what you want to say is just giving a propositional account of how one is, um, say, able to do something, mastering yes. uh, an ability. But it seems to me that, uh, I mean, if the, intellectual, uh, the intellectualist claim says that when I, uh, I master an ability, then I, I must be able to give an account, a propositional account, that's not true for the reasons that have been said. Uh, mainly, I may not be able to do it. But doesn't mean that actually someone else, and say the assessor or the evaluator, isn't able to give an account of that ability. So, um, so my question is uh, whether you mean by giving account that the performer, the subject, the master of the ability needs to be able to give an account in their terms, those terms, or whether you want to mean, um, make you know, the more modest claim that it must, there must be a way to give an account of uh, uh, a practice. Yes, well, again, I'm, I'm going to focus my answer on professional qualifications because I've already made some qualification in, in terms of non-professional activities. And I think the first thing to say about this is that um, there are different kinds of accounts that you can give. Uh, there are fully context-independent propositional explanations. There are context-dependent accounts which involve uh, ostension, for example. There are also what I'd call inactive forms of giving an account, where you do, as it were, actually perform some of the actions of the kind of activity that uh, you want to demonstrate. Uh, to take another example of uh, Bengston and Moffat, there is Irina who can't do a quintuple salka, which apparently is a, an ice skating maneuver which involves twisting five times in the air. She can do a quadruple one. So she could say, uh, she could give an account of how to do it by doing a quadruple one and saying, it's like this only with one more turn to it. So that seems perfectly feasible. Now, the other point I think is a slightly more difficult one. Um, I, I argued in the talk that in many cases uh, you cannot give a complete explanation of how you do what you do. And that gap between the explanation and the action I, I call tacit knowledge. Now that's, that necessarily means I think that in lots and lots of cases uh, you, it would be completely unreasonable to expect a complete account from the candidate. Uh, so the assessor, to go back to the previous question, has also got to be able to understand and appreciate the tacit knowledge involved in s successful execution as well. Oh, no, I, no, I didn't, didn't say that. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, what, I, what I would argue is that um, in a complex occupation like teaching, where, as we, we know, we, we can make observations of candidate teachers and we, we can rely on the teachers in whose classes they work, we are necessarily sampling a range of what they are doing. In, in the performance of their duties. And in order to assure ourselves that they can operate in complex, unpredictable conditions, we may, we are entitled, I think, to ask them, what would you do in such and such circumstances? And we would ex expect an explanation which gives us sufficient confidence to be able to conclude that they would, in fact, know how to successfully react in those sorts of circumstances. That's where the role of, of the account comes in in the case of teaching. Thank you. That's, that, we had very 
two uh, excellent talks and I think uh, both of them raised very interesting possibilities to, uh, to think about in the situation in India. Secularism and the relationship of religion to the state in India is very is, is a, also a very rich concern. I was telling Sebastian he should try and think about what is what has been the development in India of, of this on this issue. And similarly the, uh, the talk about the social uh, guarantee for a profession, I think this is also an area which we haven't started thinking about in India. So even if we start thinking about it in, uh, in maybe starting with very simple things like bricklayer and ski instructor, then we can think about for more complex things like the ones we probably are all interested in. But it was really a pleasure. Thank you.